Okay, time for another episode of the Snife High Podcast. And I feel I need to come up with uh, a theme song. And I think this is what I want to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best impression of the theremin, which was used in all these classic sci-fi movies and some episodes of TV, which was like the... So there's your theme, ladies and gentlemen. There's your theme. <laughs> good, good. <sighs> oh, I'm out of breath. I, I walked a little bit, and so now I'm out of breath. And that's what happens when uh, you're circling 40 and you do the kind of workout routine that I do, which is not. But at any rate, uh, okay. So I normally like to start out with some sci-fi news, but there's no sci-fi news that really got my attention. Uh, so I started reading some articles on actual science, and I, I came across one where they're talking about searching for extraterrestrial signals out there in uh, space. Do I need to say in space? I mean, if they're looking for extraterrestrial signals on Earth, that would be terrestrial signals, uh, and you'd have to really question who funded that project and why. But at any rate, Here's my overall question with searching for uh, extraterrestrials at this point. Let's say we find an alien race, okay? And we we open a dialogue with them. What are we going to say? What are we really going to say? Because it feels... Us talking to aliens feels to me like me going out on a first date. I know everything that's wrong with me. And so really, the question I have to answer is, when am I going to let them know? How far into the relationship before we mention uh, the war and the death and the, uh, the mass destruction? Now, am I talking about me or am I talking about the Earth at that point? Ah, excellent question. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I guess with me, it would be metaphorical destruction, what I do mentally, although... Uh, I could also argue that I'm, I contribute to the greater destruction of the world by being a part of the process, the chain that that involves, you know, the the the, the you know buying this technology that's built by uh, uh, labor who's drastically not paid for what they deserved, etc. This is turning into a guilt podcast. That's what this is, and I uh, have no idea. Uh, yeah, as a long story short, I, maybe it's good that we're not talking to the aliens. I uh, because what you know either we, we're we're gonna have to choose: do we lie? Do we tell the truth? Uh, and I I would vote tell the truth. I think I, I, any the first we shouldn't say we come in peace. That should not be the first thing that we say to aliens. The first thing that we should say to aliens is: hey, lower your expectations. Whatever you think, it's worse. That's what we've got. Okay. Look, just don't, you know, if you're looking for answers, this is the wrong planet. We're the ones looking for answers. If, if you're looking for a, uh, you know, if you're, lo- if, if you're looking for help, if you're looking to make things better, we, we really don't offer that unless, unless you'd like to have our coffee. I, fe- I have a feeling that's what's going to, they're going to come. And I think they're going to come away with it going, oh, we like Starbucks. And that's about it. So that's my thought there on, on, uh, on <laughs> that's my sci-fi news, if you will. So what I want to discuss today uh, is a movie called Altered States. And uh, I love this movie. I really do. I, I've watched it a million times. I, I don't know. It's, uh, I love the visuals of it. Uh, I I love the concept of it. Uh, all all it, one of my favorites, and so it'll be an absolute pleasure ripping it to pieces, <laughs> but from a place of love. Hopefully, anyone listening uh, who's a fan of altered states will will get that. It is from a place of love when I tear this apart, um, and I'm really not tearing it apart. I'm just making some hopefully uh, urbane and witty observations about a movie that came out in 1980. Because if it's one thing I like to do, it's really be at the at the cutting edge of the zeitgeist. So here we go. Wikipedia article summarizing altered states. 
Uh, Edward Jessup is a 1970s psychopathologist who, while studying schizophrenia, begins to think that our other states of consciousness are as real as our waking states. Fabulous premise. And, and in science, what they're saying now is that, you know, what we see, what we think of as reality could be a giant computer simulation or a giant simulation. Not necessarily a computer simulation. I hope it's not a computer simulation. And if it is a computer simulation, I'll tell you something. I hope it's a good computer. Because if it's, you know, running on one of these older versions of Windows, not only am I terrified, that would also explain a great deal about everything. That explains my life right there. All of my 20s, that, that could, that somebody was hitting Control-Alt-Delete. And if this is a simulation, what I want to know is, was the simulation designed? Like, we could all be living on a really, really depressing level of doom. And, and, what, and if it was designed, what for? Uh, that's, that's what I would like to know. I mean, who, what computer programmer in another dimension is creating us going, you know, I want to create a world where where uh, things are hard. <laughs> That's... Uh, what, so wh- why did you... Uh, what's the purpose of creating this? I, you know, I, uh, I'm, mis- I'm depressed, and I want to create a universe of people who are more depressed. I don't want to be the only one. I don't want to be the only non-depressed thing. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the one person in this other dimension who is not depressed, who wants friends, who feel the way that he feels. God is an emo kid who does not want to play high school sports. I think that's entirely, based on the entire universe that I'm seeing and based on this world, I I think, frankly, I think you should start paying me uh, and I, my religion is correct. Edward begins experimenting with sensory deprivation using a flotation tank aided by two like-minded researchers, Arthur Rosenberg and Mason Parrish. Now, what's weird about this in, in the Wikipedia article is that in the movie they weren't really like-minded because Arthur... Uh, was all for it, and Mason was trying to dissuade them from it and was skeptical and was fighting them on it. So that was, that's an odd way of describing it, that, that dare I say it is perhaps not that accurate. No offense to the person who wrote the article. I'm sure you're doing your best. Uh, uh, but uh, that's, I, maybe you're, well, I mean, you know, they, they, par- they both participate, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they were like-minded. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quibble there. Uh, look at me, look at me quibbling with someone else who wrote, who I don't even know, who wrote the article for this. Uh, I think both of us need uh, to do more with women. All right, what, you know what, that's an assumption. For all I know, this person is happily married. This person could be, by the way, or this is a, a woman who's happily married to a guy or to another woman. I don't want to make any assumptions here. I certainly don't want to do that. Now, now I feel guilt. This see at every podcast I do. At, at some point, I end up feeling guilty about everything I said. Then I need to uh, issue an apology. I want to apologize to the person who wrote the Wikipedia article. All I'm doing is pointing out, saying maybe like I wouldn't say they were like-minded. That's all. I don't want to start anything. I don't want to start anything. Arthur, uh, the character of Arthur, by the way, the friend, one of the one who's more like-minded than the other, played by Bob Balaban, excellent actor. And here's what I love about Bob Balaban. Bob Balaban is really good at playing intellectual characters who kind of stand back and judge. Uh, I, that's what I... He, he excels at that. Those are my... That he's my favorite. He, I think he's in every science fiction movie in the 80s. And usually the main character is getting beaten the crap out of and he's standing on the side going, you know, that's very interesting. That's that's certainly an experience you're having. That is. I won't actually participate because I'm much smarter than you are. But uh, please continue. Please go on. At a faculty party, 
uh, Edward meets fellow whiz kid and biological anthropologist Emily, and the two eventually marry. So their relationship is the core of this movie. And in a weird, odd way, as bizarre as it gets, really the theme of the movie is true love conquers all, uh, even existence, which depresses me because I'm alone and single. And it's like it's, it's their love that saves them at the end. And I'm like, ah, I don't need to see this. I want to see a science fiction movie where the, it, the person is not in love and that's what saves him. Where he's about to be sucked into nothingness and then he, re- he remembers, wait a minute, I'm single. I can watch Netflix whenever I want. I'm bringing myself back. So, all right. Now that then, the, so they they decide to get married. It jumps seven years. Edward and Emily have two daughters and are on the brink of divorce and reunite with the the couple who first introduced them. And if, I remember when I was watching this, I'm thinking, wow, this is such a time jump. We go from falling in love to, oh, we're getting divorced. And then I realized that it's not a time jump. It's reality. <laughs> People are getting together and breaking up that fast. It's, it's a moment, uh, one of several in, in science fiction, where suddenly it's no longer science fiction. It's, oh, d- 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 the truth. Uh, when Edward hears of a Mexican tribe that experiments that experiences shared hallucin- shared illusion states, he travels to Mexico to participate in what is apparently a ayahuasca ceremony. Now, here's what I noticed, folks. I feel like mystical experiences always happen in Mexico. That's where you go for the mystical experience. I have yet to see a science fiction film where they go for a mystical experience in Canada. This, I don't know. I just I want to see that where they go to Canada and there's a moose up there that uh, is connected with alternate dimensions. And when you look into the moose's eyes, suddenly you're in an asteroid somewhere else with green aliens. You never see that. You never get that from Mexico. You go to have a mystical experience. Canada, you go because, you know, isn't Montreal lovely? That's two different, two totally different travel itineraries right there. In one place you go to uh, transform into a multicolored coyote, to another place you go because, you know, darn, if it just isn't, it just isn't just a wonderful city, there's a great scene. There's a great scene there. That's a great scene. During the walk into the bush, his guide says that the indigenous tribe they are meeting works with uh, Amanita Muscaria, which they are collecting for next year's ceremonies. I'm butchering a culture and a language. Now, I know this is a part of the movie, by the way, where there, he goes in and he just ba- he basically demands to take their drug and to be in their ceremony. Uh, a situation where a white man goes in to an indigenous people and says, I, I demand this. Uh, and that, again, this is the other part of the movie that we're like, ah, well, that, that's, that, that's absolutely correct. Nicely done. Yes, that's exactly, what, that's exactly what we would do. That's exactly what we do do. Go in and make demands. Uh, the tribe call one of the ingredients of the mixture they use first flour. Uh, an indigenous elder is seen with uh, the root in his hand before cutting Edward's hand, adding blood to the mixture that he is preparing. And see, that's how you know it's going to be serious when they when they use the blood. When they use the blood of the protagonist, you know we're going on a journey, we're going on a ride, because they're using his blood. Uh, I feel like they could have used just a piece of hair or maybe a fleck of skin. No, 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 it's got to be blood. It's got to be blood, the life essence. Always blood when they're mixing it with uh, these concoctions to know that we are serious. Blood. The blood is life. Or he didn't need to use the blood. He just thought this guy's an idiot, but he's not going to know. He comes in here demanding being a part of this uh, ceremony. Fine. We need to cut your finger off for this. Oh yeah, we oh yeah, we all do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I mean, no one in this room has done it lately. But yeah, it's it's part of the tradition, and we need to punch in the balls too. That need, that's also a part of the tradition as well. Uh, yeah, what are you gonna go look it up? Do you read? You don't read. <laughs> you conquer. You're, you're European. Immediately after consuming the mixture, Edward experiences bizarre, intense hallucinations, uh, which describes a ten-minute sequence. My favorite part of the sequence in the hallucinations is that he sees his wife naked, assuming the position of the Sphinx. She turns into sand and is slowly blown away by the wind. Which, as bizarre as that sounds, really describes, I think, most relationships that I see. Uh, is It starts out sexy and then it's it ends with a, a dead monument. That really actually is, is quite quite accurate now that I think about it. Now he mentions what he's looking for. What they, what they mention too is that with this drug you can start to go back in time or back to the beginnings of the universe and the notion that the universe began as a thought which I've heard in other places which, sound, which is a fascinating idea that the universe began with a thought. But what thought was it? I'm going to guess that the thought was, was this and I quote Oh God, not this. I, that, I think that was the opening thought of the universe. Ah, ah, this. Is this it? This? Okay. Because after all, God is an old Jewish man. I think we can all agree on that. Edward returns to the U.S. with a tincture of the, the, the potion and continues taking it to trigger altered states of consciousness. Now, uh, now a little later, he's gonna he's gonna regress and he's gonna turn into a uh, an ape man, and I was thinking this would be you know this would be an interesting drug to smuggle in, and suddenly have all these teens turning into apes all over the place, and it becomes a whole epidemic. Honey, have you been taking that drug? <laughs> Honey, I think you're lying. When toxic concentrations of the substance make increased dosage dangerous, Edward returns to sensory deprivation, believing it will enhance the effects of the substance as current dose. The fact that he keeps testing it on himself. This is why I love the Bob Balaban character. Because the Bob Balaban character, that's the character I would play, which is the character who would say, I would never test this on myself, but I will totally be there to watch you do it. Absolutely, I will record it. Of course! I wouldn't miss this for the world. You take as much as you need to. Hey, the levels are dangerous, and I don't think you should do this. But if you're going to do this, please, I, you know, can I bring a friend? Repairing a disused tank in a medical school, Edward uses it to experience a series of increasingly drastic visions, including one of the early hominid eye. I don't think I said that right. Now, here's, here's my problem with this whole thing. Every time he takes these drugs, he starts to regress and he's he's turning into, you know, he's, he's becoming he's de-evolving. If I could take this drug and it could it could change to different stage of consciousness states of consciousness, I would want to go forward. I want the body of Vin Diesel and the ability to only eat sugar and live forever. That's I don't want to go back. I've seen what back is. I want to yeah, I, I'm not that impressed. I want to go forward. Uh, or if not even forward, let's go laterally. Let's just, you know, let's just create a state of consciousness where there's never traffic. How about that? Monitored by his colleagues, Edward insists that his visions have externalized. And of course, they don't believe him, uh, which is why both of his colleagues, I think, would work really well as Harry Potter's teachers. Because to, be, to qualify to be one of Harry Potter's teachers, you have to not believe that bad things are happening until you get killed or until it's too late. That's you have to be an idiot to work at Hogwarts. That's what I've learned there. I know I'm I'm jumping into fantasy here. Uh, forgive me. I'm going I'm a little off message, but emerging from the tank, his mouth bloody, frantically writing notes because he is unable to speak. Edward insists on being x-rayed before he reconstitutes. And you know, I came out of Star Wars the Rise of Skywalker in the exact same state. <laughs> hey. Comedy. A radiologist inspecting the x-rays says they belong to a gorilla. And at that point, they still don't believe him, which, you know, again, go work at Hogwarts. In later experiments, Edward experiences actual physical biological de-evolution. 
And what I love, by the way, about this Wikipedia article is that it's it's reading like it's an, it actually happened, like it's an actual uh, uh, experiment. That's the wording of it. That's what I love about this summary. At one stage, he, he emerges from the isolation tank as a feral and curiously small-statured, light-skinned caveman going on a rampage through some streets in town before returning to his natural form. So he breaks into the zoo at this, at this point as the caveman, and he's running around the elephants, and he hits the elephant on the head. And I was sitting there thinking, well, I, I'm assuming they didn't actually hit the elephant on the head. It was trick photography. But then I thought, oh, well, this is still depressing because it's still an elephant that's, you know, a trick. It's, a, it's still a domesticated elephant. So even if they're treating the elephant nicely, they're really not. I'm watching elephant slavery. Uh, this is a very, it's a very depressing moment in the movie. And I should, again, I should feel guilty as a human being. I'd like to, I would like to enter an altered state of consciousness where we don't have zoos anymore and we uh, stop destroying the land so uh, animals don't die out. How about that? Let's, let's do that. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting Bill Nye, Ed Begley Jr. here with this altered state of consciousness. Despite the colleague's concern, Edward stubbornly continues. In the final experiment, Edward experiences a more profound regression, transforming into an amorphous mass of conscious primordial, primordial matter. And, you know, the, what he looks like, to be honest, he looks like depression. If depression were a thing, that's what he looked like. Just this blob. Uh, and uh, I... This is... And, and this is the, uh, the one of my favorite parts of the movie, because... The room that he's in, an energy wave released from the experiment, stuns Edward's colleagues and destroys his tank. And Emily arrives to find a swirling maelstrom where the tank had been. So the, there's this giant swirl in the middle of the room, and Emily is trying to walk into the middle of this swirl, and she sees the universe! She looks down into the whirlpool, and she sees the cosmos. Just And, and dimension and energy and time and space folding into one, and then somehow... In all of that, she she scoops up the energy that is her husband and pulls and pulls him out. So she goes in. She looks into a portal that is the universe. That is that is all of everything of all the thoughts and all the experience and all the feelings. And she's like, ah, there he is. Ah, there it is. There he is. Come up here, silly, silly, silly husband. Picking him up. This goes beyond needle in a haystack. How could she see him? I think she's the... I want to see a movie about her. I think this is a secret superhero movie. I think it takes superpowers to go into existence and pull someone out like it's nothing. They bring Edward home, hoping that the transformations will end. Watched over by Emily, Edward begins to uncontrollably regress again, the transformations no longer requiring intake to first flower or sen sensory deprivation. And this is my favorite part of the movie. Urging Edward to fight the change, Ed Emily grabs his hand, immediately being enveloped by the primordial energy emanating from Edward. The sight of his wife, apparently being consumed by the energy, stirs the human consciousness in Edward's devolving form. He fights the transformation and returns to human form. And how does he do it? By punching the wall. <laughs> That's what the whole movie leads up to. He has returned to a primordial state of existence. He's fighting it. He can't get it out. How does he get out of it? Punching the wall several times with frustration. <laughs> that is the scientific way <laughs> of getting out of this. These are scientists. And everything thus far has been very scientific uh, it's been, oh, we com make this, we, com we combine this uh, potion when we use the deprivation tank and we do this and we're taking and we're collecting data and we're being very scientific about it. And what does it boil down to? Punch the wall. Come on. Walk it off. Walk it off, Jessup. Walk it off. And by the way, this is an apartment. Okay. So while he's punching the wall, trying to get back into our dimension... That's got to really suck for the neighbors. What's he doing? What's he doing? He's, he's regressing again. Ah, oh, God. 
We complained about this. We complained about this. Shouldn't this be in the rental agreement that you can't regress? What are we going to do? Well, call, you know, call, you know, well, here. Hey, hey, we're trying to sleep here. And I'm wondering, by the way, if that's, you know, when they write their thesis on this, uh, you know, it should say in the event that you transform into a primordial being uh, and you're trying to get out of it. Step one, find a load bearing wall. Step two, hit it repeatedly. Step three, you know, have a lot of anger and a lot of determination. And step four, there you go. You'll be back. In the final scene, Edward embraces Emily and she returns to normal. Now, my question is, does he have flare-ups for the rest of his life? Is there a scene 40 years from now where he's this primordial goop again and she's sitting there with the adult kids and she's like, ah, oh, you're... Your father's an amoeba again. All right, I'll, I'll handle it. No, no, Mom, I got it. No, 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 I'll get it. I'll get it. Here, I just got to reach down into this soup of universe. So what can we take away from this? Well, there's more to the universe than, than what we can see. And once we know how it all works, my theory is we'll still be miserable. That was the lesson he learned. He was like, I saw, you know, I, I saw the origins of the universe. I, I saw all the answers and the, it's nothingness. And, and so the only thing that's left is you, my dear. That's what he, he professes his love. I see now that, that, that you are what's important, which is a compliment kind of. But the more I think about it, it's almost like saying, well, there is no God. So I guess you're the next best thing. So uh, I guess I'll sort of stop sleeping with these 20 year old students of mine now and we'll get back together. How does that sound? How does that work for you? <laughs> That's what I've learned from my journey. But I think there's some truth to this. I have a feeling that that if even if we found all the answers to the universe and we understood, ah, this is a simulation or or we are in several different dimensions, I think we would continue or at least I would continue to be as depressed as I was before. And if there is a god and meet, we meet him I'm afraid to. I really am afraid to. I think best case scenario, it'll be like meeting a movie star where it's cordial, where it, luckily, you know, he's not mean. That's that's all I'm asking. That'll be the best case scenario. But beyond that, I I don't know. I'm 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 not I'm not expecting great things. All right. Well, that's uh, that's altered states. That's nice. So this ended up being about a 30-minute podcast. A bit more succinct this time. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, next week will be... I don't know what I'll be back with next week. Uh, something science fiction related. That, that's certainly the theme of the podcast. Uh, and uh, until then, you know, uh, Jolon True. Hey, look at me speaking Romulan because I'm watching Picard. <laughs>